Um, I've stuck to the template that um, Professor Turner circulated, so uh, I tried to keep to, to, um, to the format that was asked. But I suppose I have to um, uh, confess up front, there isn't a drill. I, I thought I was going to find a drill somewhere, but people aren't doing drills around uh, pulmonary embolism. And uh, I, I, I've worked one out, and then I'll show you a slide at the end. And it, it answered a question for me, because I was working on it yesterday, really. Um, and that was, you know, are we going to invent a new set of drills for ourselves in Ireland, or are we going to use some of the off-the-shelf solutions? And in particular, I suppose, We've put a lot of effort into prompt in, 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 uh, in our hospital, and I, I find it particularly uh, good and very engaging and practical. It's, a bit, it's like low fidelity simulation in the clinical setting. But on, re on reflection, and I know uh, Professor Turner's views, I, I have a nuanced uh, answer to that question, and that is we're going, we need iPrompt. And uh, it, you know, the overall thing in my mind when I was thinking about it, why do we need it? It's that we need to do a lot of things together in Irish obstetrics and Irish maternity services if only to rekindle our self-confidence and our certainty that what we do, we can do and have done to a very high standard. So, Michael, if he's there, I can't see him. I'm with you. We're going to have an Irish version, uh, even if it's a close copy of the B prompt. That's the British prompt. So, look, um, I don't know how I use uh, this. Sorry. So this is the uh, format. We're going to talk a good bit about diagnosis, uh, less about the treatment, and some of the key challenges. And the context um, I'll speak about in terms of the epidemiology, but I did want to acknowledge the fact that we're working on a new national guideline that's going to look at uh, treatment. We had uh, a guideline published last year, 2013, on prophylaxis. And we learned an awful lot. When you talk about multidisciplinary learning, I think it appeals into insignificance doing drills with your colleagues uh, to writing a guideline. We learned a lot about that. We had an awful lot of consultation. We thought we'd done a lot. But in fact, we, we, we learned how difficult it is when you have at least two specialty groups work in the one guideline. So this time, uh, four weeks ago, we, we had our biennial training, joint hematology obstetric training day. And uh, we had agreement from the uh, experts here that they would contribute to write the guidelines. So that work will take place in the next three or four months. It's been commissioned by Professor Turner, and we hope to be in position to present uh, the draft at a number of conferences, which is what we did before with the prophylaxis one. So we'll be going to Mullingar for the medical disorders one, we hope, and uh, onwards to the hematology conferences. And that worked very well, and we learned an awful lot uh, from it. Uh, and it needs a broader group, as we'll come to now. Uh, in terms of death, um, I'm delighted we're now recording deaths, and the rate there uh, for Ireland in the first report of our mortalities is a rate of one per 100,000 maternities, and that compares really uh, internationally. So again, uh, I think in, in, in the swirling kind of uncertainty that's going around on a lot of issues at the moment, I think we've got to be very clear, like there is data out there, and data for me trumps opinion and melodrama. Data is very important, and we have data, and, and overall the outcomes aren't bad. Of course we can improve, but I, I'm cautious ab about ever saying, you know, we get to zero on things, but look, the rate is, is, is actually low. The CMS data I is similar, and, and of course, it's, it, because it's so long established, it's very useful when you think about pulmonary embolism, how big a problem is it? It is actually a problem that is showing signs of diminishing, and that's important, uh, and it underscores uh, I think the, the concept that in terms of management of pulmonary embolism, the most important thing is that you prevent it. So this is, the, this is where it sits. You know, it's one, two, three, four, five, sixth um, uh, cause of maternal mortality. I know that's a mixture of direct and indirect. But it has been falling. And, and, and there's been a pretty clear, now maybe, maybe this won't be uh, continuing, but there's been a pretty clear drop since the introduction of widely disseminated guidelines in the United Kingdom, and of course, we, we, we have been using the Green Top guidelines as well. And, and I think uh, you've got to remember this is in spite of or in face of an epidemic of one of the biggest risk factors, which is obesity. So I think there's something real going on. And, and I look at, if I could stop the talk there, I, I might just do it, but I have to keep going. So people have mentioned the, the iceberg, the iceberg. Uh, Somehow I misinterpreted the iceberg. I, I, I made it a pyramid. And um, 
We're up right at the top. That's what we're talking about today, the, the you know, acute management. But actually, it, it runs right down in this disorder. Uh, and just to, to, to get some sense of what's happening in terms of the bottom part of that perimeter iceberg, I wanted to just look at uh, some of the epidemiological data beneath death. And of course, um, uh, Bridget mentioned a severe maternal morbidity, and we have now Irish data again, and, and our data, I say it again, our data is comparable with some of the best countries internationally. And you can see where pulmonary embolism sits there. I mean, it's a lot less than major obstetric hemorrhage, but um, it, it is one of the major causes of uh, maternal morbidity. Uh, UCOS has been used, and I think this is one of the most fabulous things that's happened in the United Kingdom in terms of uh, obstetrics in the past 15 years. Um, has been quoted in several of the talks. It gives us, and what they've been doing is looking at disorders that are quite uncommon and then getting enough numbers to make some interpretation possible. One of the, the first one, in fact, is the first study, I think, uh, that they published was on pulmonary embolism uh, over a course of just over a year and a bit, and that 140 cases, their rate was 1.3 per 10,000 maternities, and they identified, even just going back to 2008, the data was collected 10 years ago, um, now that BMI was a real big one, and that's keeping coming. One of the kind of um, rules of thumb that uh, certainly we were uh, taught, and it, it was highlighted in some of the early confidential reports, was that you know, half your PEs are antenatal, half are postnatal, and the antenatal ones divide one-third, one-third, one-third. And if you remember, going back four or five confidential inquiries, there's a big emphasis on that first trimester. And I think just in, in terms of where the data is going, though, uh, the better data we're getting is showing that the biggest risks are actually in late pregnancy. And this is the, um, I suppose, summary slide from that uh, UCOS data. And then in the last two years, two big data sets have been reported, and they've had a whole series of follow-on uh, publications on the same data sets. There's a Danish set, which looks at uh, 727 VTEs uh, from you know, a huge number of pregnant women, almost a million there. And what they highlighted was the absolute risk antenatally, 10.7 uh, per 10,000 pregnancy years, 17.5 in the perperium. But look at the graph when you look at it. Uh, it. There isn't a big uplift in terms of relative risk in the first and second trimester. Yes, there are cases there. And of course, we need to be aware the risk is slightly increased. But the, the relative risk here is of the order of one point something two in the second trimester, and then it goes way up towards the end, and again, it's very high, 22 in the perperium. And that increased risk stays up uh, to, uh, and certainly is very high up until at least three weeks after delivery. And this is a similar data set, big data set from 255 GP practices, and it's 3.9 million, or 2.9 million uh, anonymized patients in that data set. And they've uh, been able to uh, look at this uh, in a whole series of publications, and again, what they've shown is that the big uplift in terms of relative risk is just in the weeks before delivery, and in particular after delivery, and it stays significantly raised up to at least three to four weeks out, and it's increased um, uh, certainly until six or eight weeks. So just a change in the epidemiology to note that you know, the, the increased risk is most in late pregnancy. That, that was what we were talking with students, and then it changed over uh, when we were in training. And, and in terms of the data, it's very clear. That is the big risk period. And very high relative risk stays there until at least three weeks postpartum. And we need to continue to collect observational data. One of the things, though, if you're in an area or working in an area or writing guidelines in an area where you've only got observational data, is that there is an inverse relationship between the intensity and the length of time you debate any guidelines to the actual information and evidence that you have. So we spend a lot of time debating the guideline and prophylaxis, and I think we'll spend a lot less on the treatment of, uh, I hope so anyway, pulmonary embolism. So here are the guidelines that um, I, I, I have been looking at, and we have one to add. That is the one that's most pertinent to this talk. But the prophylaxis one is uh, out there since uh, 2013. The green top guideline is one we, we, we probably defer to uh, in 2007, and there's also the EGCOG uh, guideline 2013. So I said the most uh, important part of, of uh, management of preeclampsia is actually in terms of the diagnosis. And the difficulty, the difficulty is that uh, the diagnosis is very complex. And we had some beautiful slides in earlier talks about the 
uh, from uh, Larry Crowley in particular, but the, the changes, the physiological changes, and how they then get in the way of us assessing a patient. And really, the patient with P is a classic example of that. Uh, this is taken from the, the, the B Moe um, text, um, and a very poor text it is too, it won't be as good as our one. But um, they quote, they, they take this verbatim from the American College uh, Educational Bulletin. So when you look at the, the, the kind of symptoms, God, they're very common things. How often does a patient complain of tachypnea, shortness of breath? Well, 75% of the time is what our textbook tells us. Three quarters of our patients have the symptom, you know, the most common symptom for PE. So di clinical diagnosis is difficult. You can't apply the usual risk scores uh, in pregnancy. Roughly in the non-pregnant patient, someone who presents with, a, you know, with a, a suspected diagnosis of pulmonary embolism, the chance is about one quarter when you investigate them on the basis of that, that you'll pick up a PE. The quoted figure in our uh, area in pregnancy is about one in 10, and uh, those who were at the uh, Joint Hematology Obstetric meeting uh, four weeks ago, Beverly Hunt from uh, Guys and Thomas's, said that she's unpublished data to show, I think, one in 30. So 30 of their patients, they're extensively investigating all the way through um, with um, a complex radiology, uh, and they're picking up one IP. So uh, look, again, if I could stop, I'd stop here. The single most important thing is to a high index of suspicion, and it's not going to be easy, uh, and uh, you've just got to stick with it. So what's the initial management when someone does present with some of the suspicious signs? Uh, well, the first thing is if you uh, assess them and you are worried, then uh, could I, if I could summarize, stick with it. You need to treat the patient as if they have a pulmonary embolism, and then you need to investigate them. And more than that, even if you're not happy after investigation, you leave them on the treatment. So it's a, it's a key take-home message that there's a lot of uncertainty even about the optimum investigation. So in terms of patients who present, the difficult ones for us are the ones who present with commonly with very mild symptoms, maybe some shortness of breath. Is it different from the 14 patients you met in the clinic that day who are a bit short of breath? A little bit of chest pain, is it just a little bit of musculoskeletal chest pain? They got, you know, they're heavily pregnant. Uh, a mild tachycardia, is it physiologically uh, the tachycardia that we expect? It's easier if they have cardiovascular collapse because then you just go to uh, bow chops and um, I was going to say ABC, but B, A, C, I think, and you're away. So if they're unstable, if they're unstable, and this is where, this is one of the things uh, um, that we have certainly gained. I mean, I mentioned uh, about postpartum hemorrhage when we were in the Erinville and standalone. These kind of cases, the physicians, the hematologists, the, the respiratory people arrive in our ER in a matter of minutes as quickly as we are there if we're really worried about a patient. And in the past, I'm not sure how we dealt with them. But the unstable patient, certainly uh, there is a broad repertoire of intervention that's available among our general uh, colleagues, that is colleagues who work in general hospitals, and I'll mention some of them later. The initial investigations, though, for the stable patient, full blood count, a baseline clotting, ECG and arterial blood gas. Of course we do those, and we're always looking for the signs Q1, S3, T3, or whatever it is, and we never see them. Or if we do see them, we don't believe them if the patient looks well. So the take-home message is that the evidence supports our skepticism. Those two investigations don't add a lot. So if you're clinically suspicious and you have a normal ECG and a normal blood gas, it's not actually that helpful and there's good data to support you. Stick with it and you need to go further. In terms of the diagnostic in investigation, the three uh, or four big things you need to uh, do, a uh, chest X-ray, uh, lower limb Doppler, and then the two uh, respiratory investigations, that is uh, CTPA and BQ scanning. The numbers have been changed. But the numbers left Cork in a nice order and they turned up on the screen here in one place. Just to come back to shortness of breath and respiratory distress, this is the kind of differential you need to consider. And uh, it, it, just coincidentally, there's a review of the, diff the uh, assessment, the clinical assessment of a patient 25 weeks with shortness of breath as the clinical um, case in the New England Journal two weeks ago. And it's worth reading because it goes over a lot of the ground and a lot of the things that have been discussed today. In terms of what you're looking at, does, could the patient have pneumonia? Could it be an exacerbation of asthma? 
What about some of the causes? Louise uh, obviously was talking about eclampsia, but uh, our primary presentation with pulmonary edema is not that uncommon, and we do see it as a first presentation. And it could, in an we otherwise well patient, mimic this disorder. And here's where um, we have uncertainty. And here's where I'm going to defer to the outcomes of that multidisciplinary team discussions as to how we best investigate them. And I, I, I told you what the elements were. Chest X-ray, CUS is compression ultrasound or Doppler, uh, Doppler, we sometimes call it the lower limbs. And then CTPA versus VQ scan. Uh, this one is taken from uh, ACOG. It's approved by the American Thoracic Society and the Society of Thoracic Radiologists. But it is uh, quite different from uh, this one, for instance, which I took from one of the most widely quoted reviews in pulmonary embolism from the Lancet in 2010. And I just didn't have time to get the one we have published from CUH, which puts a big emphasis on half strength perfusion only scans as the investigation of choice beyond chest X-ray. A lot of the discussion and the debate is academic if you don't have the facilities to do both of them. But where you do, and uh, certainly uh, we do in CUH, then there is a discussion uh, to be had about which of these investigations should be the investigation of choice. And in, in summary, the, the issues that would um, be important, first of all, there is a difference in terms of the effects of the type of radiation exposure. And um, VQ, for what it's worth, increases the um, rate of a childhood cancer uh, to about 1 in 250,000, uh, as opposed to 1 in a million. CTPA, though, increases the background risk of subsequent breast cancer in the mother, 13% increase on a background risk of 1 in 200 lifelong uh, risk. For me, it's, I know it's low risk, but actually isn't it the perfect example of something that Professor Turner mentioned? We are always struggling, or very often struggling, to balance up the risk to the two patients we look after. And somehow, uh, we have, over time, got very good at doing that so perhaps in recent times we've got bad at articulating how good we are. It is difficult, but um, by and large, the, uh, most of the international guidelines suggest where you have it, if you have a choice, the VQ scan would be the, uh, inter uh, the uh, in investigation of choice. And that is something we need to be aware of because in the non-pregnant, it's quite clear all the societies now recommend CTPA. Now there are some issues about the test characteristics. Certainly. Uh, CTPA is not good for your small uh, peripheral uh, PEs. And the uh, CTPA uh, is also probably the tr investigation of choice in the patient that is unstable. We want to do it quickly. We want to find out if it's available. It is more useful. The last point, though, is the availability. So while we recommend and have published in our hospital a half-strength perfusion scan, we don't have isotope available on a Friday. I'm not quite sure what that means. But Monday to Thursday, we do a half-strength uh, um, uh, half uh, perfusion scan. And the rest of the days of the week, and outside working hours, we do CTPA. And I think for most people, that's going to be a clincher, because uh, it, both techniques aren't immediately available. And if someone's going to offer you one over the other in someone you're really worried about, or in, in particular if someone's unstable, you're, you're going to go with what the radiologist offers you. But if, if you have a choice, VQ scan, number one, so the take-home message. In terms of treatment, the initial treatment for a stable patient is therapeutic low molecular weight heparin. Uh, in, of importance, and particularly with those patients we're seeing who are hugely obese, you should not use dose capping. So it's per kg, and we have good data, including from our own unit now, when you look at the pharmacokinetics of low molecular weight heparins, that you continue to match the dose to the size of the patient. And in terms of monitoring these patients, you don't need routine anti-10A. You don't. Um, you might, might feel better if you get it, but actually anti-10A assays are so inconsistent and unreliable that unless you're really up against it, don't use anti-10A monitoring. And I know that's been something that Ireland in particular has kind of subspecialized in, but um, we need to move away from it. There are good randomized trials in the non-pregnant that low molecular weight heparin in the initial treatment 
stable patient compared to unfractional, old style unfractionated heparin is more effective, there's less hemorrhagic complications, lower mortality, and there's no reason for us not to be sure that that same won't apply in pregnancy. And the other key important thing for us is just like unfractionated heparin, low molecular weight heparin is a misnomer, these are huge molecules, they don't cross the placenta. So low molecular weight heparin is a good choice for us. And uh, the evidence um, in terms of its safety or their safety has accumulated. Uh, the most widely quoted paper is a paper by Greer and Nelson Piercy. They looked at 3,000 women uh, been given low molecular weight heparin pregnancy and they showed very few complications and a 1% uh, recurrence. So in terms of challenges, this is one of the first challenges. This is a patient who's got a massive pee, the patient who's actually, you know, unwell, dropping their blood pressure. You, you, you have a high index of suspicion, but the patient is no longer stable. And really, this does require now individual decision making, number one. The protocol, you know, doesn't have much value in these patients. Senior input from obstetrics, from hematology definitely, from respiratory, from radiology, and if you have it, from cardiothoracic surgery, interventional radiology, from the cardiologists themselves. And, and we have had cases on occasion where we've needed all those inputs as we're trying to, a patient who's unstable, trying to work out what is best for them. And our colleagues in the general hospital are used to looking after patients who are not pregnant, who are unstable, who they look at all the options, and of course they're, they're prompting us and saying, well, we could do this, we could do that. So a, a, I add to that uh, midwifery. Uh, not at the end, they're the, most, they're the most important specialty group uh, of all maternity services, I say that, uh, because I was sitting beside the midwives from the rotunda all morning. But midwifery is important. These patients, these patients often go all over a big general hospital campus. And you have to have midwives going with them. Because if you send these patients off, they're unstable, things happen. We've had patients... Uh, unfortunately, we have a patient's die in our radiology department from pulmonary embolism. We've had to do, uh, you know, peripartum um, cesarean section. So it's a real issue. It's very nice if they're in the maternity hospital. Everybody there knows, you know, what to do, you know, where to get the section kit. But actually, you need your midwives involved when these patients are being investigated because they're moving to places that, you know, I was going to say, no man has gone before, no, no pregnant woman has gone before. You go into one of the imaging machines and, and we have found to a cost you may not come back out if you've got a big pulmonary embolism. In terms of the treatment of these cases, uh, there is a continuing recommendation that you go back to IV unfractionated heparin. That's old style, as we all learned, you know, when we were interns and SHOs. Rarely you can uh, use thrombolysis, and I say rarely because that actually is probably the, the best treatment if someone has a massive PE. And then you can also have discussions, if the facilities are there, and depending on where you are, about thoracotomy, about surgical embolization, about catheter-based embolization, catheter mechanical embolization, and catheter thrombolysis. So there's an awful lot of things that your colleagues will suggest are possible. And uh, this is where you need uh, something written down. This is where you do need a guideline. This is where you need your app from the Irish you know, National Program in Obstetrics and Gynecology. Because I have a fear, and I am very skeptical about any student or trainee who tells me the doses of a drug they don't use very often. I can't remember them. And I make a point of not trying, because I think it's unsafe. And the problem with IV unfractionated heparin is why we all could have done this as certainly three weeks into an internship in general med, you know what to do. Now none of us can remember. So it's got to be written down, and it's got to be on your... I'm left my mobile phone down there, but it's on my mobile phone if the program comes through. It's really important because we will have all forgotten, including the hematologists, very soon. And you need to be able to adjust. Do you remember this? Adjusting the APTT? You, I mean, we're not doing it anymore, but you need to be able to do it. And an important point is that adjusting APTT in late pregnancy is actually quite difficult, and you can't interpret the data that well, and it might just be... I can see from you nodding, so I'm glad I'm on the right track. It might just be a circumstance where you need anti 10 monitoring. Two particular areas, again, you need inputs here, and I apologize to um, one of the groups that I 
couldn't get it onto the slide uh, because I'd submitted them last night, which for me was very early. Um, I wanted to add anaesthetics on the way up on the train, particularly because I saw two of my colleagues from Cork in the audience. But they're key. They're another key specialty group who you need to work with. And in particular, a key risk is in a patient who presents with a pulmonary embolus in the weeks, particularly the two weeks, before delivery. In that acute phase, you have to continue to therapeutically anticoagulate them. You want to minimize the length of time they are off anticoagulation, and yet uh, the single biggest risk is that a woman delivers therapeutically anticoagulated. I can tell you from personal experience, any time that's happened, and it happens occasionally despite your best efforts, it generally ends in an unmitigated disaster. And we have had some incredibly complex cases, in two or three of them now, patients with valves and so on, who came in, multiple, had the baby before we could switch anything off, came in at 34 weeks, and we spent days afterwards with bleeding into the uh, you know, uh, perineum uh, and, and so on and so forth. It's very difficult. So the management of those cases uh, requires definitely input from hematology, and you need to reassure your anaesthetic colleagues that the patient is off treatment for at least 24 hours before they start putting needles into patients' backs. And you're going to have to do something different. It's very different to the patient who's on prophylaxis. Very different. And you might need to, again, use unfractionated heparin because of its low half-life. So when you look at these drugs, uh, low molecular weight heparin, just kind of, I've, I've, I've idealized the time so, so the obstetricians can remember them. Low molecular weight heparin, and that's me now, 24 hours. Subcutaneous unfractionated heparin, if you're using it at high dose, at 12 hours. And IV infusion, IV unfractionated heparin, six hours. That gives you a bit of spare time. That's easy to remember, isn't it? 24, 12, 6. Fantastic. OK, there's a take-home message. The second point in this slide, uh, and again, it's, a, it's most pertinent in the patient who's had a PE just before delivery, and remember, that's most cases, is the question as to whether you put in a filter. And certainly, if you can avoid it, do. Don't rush in. So if someone presents, buy time if you can. You don't have to deliver a patient. You don't want to deliver them in the first week, ideally not in the first two weeks, and ideally not in the first three weeks. So if you can wait, wait. If you can't, a filter may have a role to play. But again, from experience, and this is experience in our own unit, we find it easy to put them in. We found it very hard to get them back out because of the changes to the vessels, we think, when you lose all that volume Larry spoke about uh, after delivery. And the anatomy changes, and these retrievable, temporary filters start to move around the place, including outside the vessel they've been put in. So put them in with caution, but they do have a role to play. And also in the patient who's having recurrent emboli uh, despite treatment. I'm almost there. Last one um, in terms of these boxes. You need a protocol written down, you'll never remember this, to reverse anticoagulation. I mean, if you do, I, I'm questioning you, your, your um, prioritization. You need to be able to reach for some you know, protocol. And on your app, you will have, I hope, in our protocol, a, 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 a table like this, which gives you an idea, because it's not exact science, how you would reverse somebody uh, who's either on unfractionated or, more, more commonly, on low molecular weight heparin. And it's not easy, and you, you, you won't remember it. Practical skills and drills. This is what I thought it might look like. We've got the common non-massive PE, the stable patient, and that might be a desktop scenario training piece in iPROMPT. Uh, and then the massive PE, the hemodynamically unstable patient, that's where I think we can do a cl clinical drill, and I'll show you a slide on that. And then the massive PE, who, the patient who's arrested, well, that's down to, to, um, uh, to C, uh, not ABC anymore, C, C, A, B, and it follows from that guideline. So you'd, you'd have a link on the app from one to the other. And this is the, what I think would be the, 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 uh, the uh, clinical drill. The setting for iPROMPT, it would be in the ER room. We don't do one in our ER room. We do them all over the labor ward and so on, but not there. And uh, you have a patient who presents new onset, shortness of breath, pruritic chest pain, hypotensive in the emergency room in the maternity hospital, and late pregnancy, and you have the usual responses, call for senior help, obstetrics, and anesthetists, and definitely in this setting, if you have anyone unstable, they're, for me, by far and away, the best people to have around. Hematology, midwifery. 
uh, you need IV access, CAB rather than MEC, uh, the initial bloods, and you consider treatment. And remember, if the patient was unstable, just go back to that, um, you have the choice of unfractionated heparin or thrombolysis. Three or four just one, one point messages to take home because I was asked to do that. One, diagnosis of P in pregnancy requires high index of suspicion. And it can be paralyzing if you're in that space because three quarters of your patients will complain of shortness of breath if you ask them. Once suspected, stick to your guns and treat them. While you're waiting all the tests, while you're trying to organize it, if it's the weekend, wait until Monday, leave them on treatment. If the investigations are negative, and you still think she may have a PE, stick to your guns. Go back to the radiologist, ask them if there's anything else they can do. If they did a BQ scan, can they do a CTPA? In a massive PE, you need individualized care and you need everyone called in to help you. The patient, literally, uh, their life is in danger. And PE at term is a particular risk of our delivery and you don't want to. You don't want to be therapeutically anticoagulated and you're gonna need a lot of input particularly from your hematologists there in terms of how you manage them around delivery. Uh, three quality improvements. All patients should be risk assessed. That's probably the most important one. Appropriate treatment. You can look at this in the patients. We should be able to look at every patient who's had a PE and make sure there's a delivery plan documented for all these patients. And this is my very last slide. If it had said going forward, I was going to put this slide in the bin. Um, but looking forward, I felt was not so politically correct. And I suggested a complete new guideline on the management of VTE, we, are, we should complete our work. And one thing only when you return to unit, and this is for everyone, highlight the importance of that you know, very, very common symptom, shortness of breath. Think of PE. Thanks very much indeed.